Welcome everyone, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. Hello everyone, we'll be starting in just a minute or two. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the intersectionality of anti-Semitism seminar series. Given the global pervasiveness of anti-Semitism, its online presence and related inroads into the mainstream, there may be no greater challenge for scholars of anti-Semitism than to reconsider our assumptions about how anti-Semites are, where and how they mobilize. This 12 part series of seminar, six that was previously in the fall and six in the spring, interrogates the identities anti-Semites presumably possess, their ideological position they prefer, and the places they inhibit. With an eye towards anti-Semitism's ideological fluidity, as well as its contradictions and corresponding convergences, we explore original, interesting, and emerging areas of anti-Semitism research. To this end, we have researchers present work on a range of topics that include, but are not exclusive to, anti-Semitism's conver convergence with misogyny, racism, and heterosexism. We're also interested in the growing, in the growing convergence between the social movements and or corporations, including news outlets, whose legitimacy and bottom line are informed by opposition to or connection with anti-Semitism. We're interested in the insights that can be gleaned from comparisons across regions, as well as those that can be had from in-depth attention to country and or site-specific case studies. So today we have the pleasure of inviting Wasik Wasik. Uh, Wasik is an associate fellow at Henry Jackson Society. As a founding trustee for the charity Muslims Against Antisemitism, Wasik is a leading voice against all forms of antisemitism, hate, and prejudice against Jewish communities worldwide. Moreover, with particular expertise in Islamism, Wasik has been raising the issue of how nonviolent Islamism is threatening Western democracies. Wasik has a BA in music technology a master's in educational leadership from UCL, and he's currently completing a PhD in war studies at King's College London. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ashade. And uh, can I also take this opportunity to thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'd like to thank um, Ira and the whole team at ISCAP for organizing this, um, and of course, Daphne um, for um, 
helping with the sound at the beginning. And of course, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Interim Managing Director, um, um, Haras Rafiq, and the founder of ISCA, uh, and someone who I admire a lot, Dr. Charles Asha Smalls. So now, contemporary anti-Semitism and li the link it has with uh, Islamism is a particularly important topic. So I'm grateful that we have the time and the space uh, to discuss this and to really interrogate the issue in, in a scholarly fashion and to really go into it in as much depth as we can um, so that we can, of, of course, gain a better understanding of how it threatens the Jewish communities um, around the world and also how it um, recruits those uh, who um, perhaps would not necessarily have any prejudice or hate towards Jews, but to find themselves um, obviously um, being drawn to some bad faith actors um, who have nothing but a hatred to Jews, Judaism, Zionism, Israel, and, and all, the, all those sorts of things. So whenever I present, what I'd like to first of all do is to ensure that um, I start off with defining things and uh, the point about making sure that a definition is there is that whenever I refer to something, it, it is clear what I'm talking about and in what context. So the first thing that I'd like to do is to um, talk about what um, contemporary antisemitism is. And in terms of antisemitism itself, I'd like to first define it. Um, I tend to um, go with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in regards to the definition of anti-Semitism. And I do believe that this is one of the strongest definitions out there. Of course, no definition is perfect, but, um, and some, you know, they, they all have their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, of course, this will have its own weaknesses, unique weaknesses, in addition to other definitions that are out there, but in comparison, in terms of um, the strengths, that I, in my view, it's um, one of the um, ones that is the strongest and the one that really we should be relying on. Uh, I do believe it is one of the um, definitions that has been adopted by many uh, companies, um, especially in the, in the UK context, uh, many um, local authority bodies have also um, taken um, this and adopted this definition. So what do the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and how do they um, define anti-Semitism? So they define anti-Semitism as a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Uh, rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. So if we break that uh, definition down a little bit and just look at some of the variables that make up this definition, what they're talking here is specifically about Jews um, and <clears throat> in regards to, or at least a perception of Jews. So having a certain perception of Jews in order for it to be anti-Semitic, it would have to be a negative perception of Jews when we're thinking about um, hatred. Uh, it cannot be obviously positive. Uh, rhetorical and physical manifestations, so the rhetorical could be uh, looking at uh, things like conspiracy theories and then physical manifestations could be um, uh, attacking Jewish uh, facilities, whether that's uh, synagogues or uh, perhaps buildings where um, uh, you have um, Jewish charities that are operating or shops or things like that. So it does talk about individuals and the properties and obviously the Jewish community as a whole and religious facilities. Just the point on um, the Jewish community, uh, it's not one community, it's a, it's a diverse community when we do think about it, it's not a, a homogenous one. So when I do refer to the Jewish community, what I mean is communities, um, but just for um, you know, the sake of clarity is just to make that point um, clear. So that's, that's the um, definition of anti-Semitism that I will be using. However, um, as I've already pointed out, there are some weaknesses to every definition and there are strengths. And in terms of advancing that um, definition, 
writer Ben Cohen actually establishes two types of anti-Semitism. Um, the first type he calls the Bayekela anti-Semitism, and the second he calls the Bistro anti-Semitism. So if we look at the first one, which is the Bayekela anti-Semitism, this is in regards to violent, abusive, vulgar, and explicitly fueled uh, by hatred. It's easy to recognize because it's something that you can see. So whether it's a swastika on someone's arm, um, we all agree, or, or, or at least all decent um, people um, agree that, that it would be contemptible. Um, it's those sorts of people that you would find um, your, your um, average anti-Semite that you can see from a mile away. Um, are, are, is the Berkeley uh, anti-Semitism, and that obviously manifests itself in, in that violent uh, behavior, the abusive behavior, vulgar, you know, whether it's spitting at a Jew, hitting a Jew, uh, treating them uh, differently and being blatant about it. Now, the second um, um, advancement that uh, Ben Cohen um, establishes is the bistro anti-Semitism. And now this anti-Semitism is slightly different to the, uh, to the Berkeller anti-Semitism because this is a polite anti-Semitism. It's uh, civil, sophisticated. Um, it's the anti-Semitism of the good people. You know, the, these guys aren't thugs. They're not the ones with the swastikas. Uh, these guys are, um, you know, middle-class people. You know, they have good jobs, good families. Um, and Manif uh, obviously, anti-Semitism manifests itself in different ways, and this is another way that it does manifest itself um, in, in that polite language, in the polite actions. Um, you know, um, if, if you uh, if someone might be offered to go to a synagogue, and the person will, um, or the bistro anti-Semitism would be politely rejecting and saying it's it's not something that uh, I'm going to be obviously um, taking taking. Um, taking part in. Now, in terms of um, those uh, two advancements of the definition of anti-Semitism, I will mainly be going, um, going back and forth between the two and also referring back to um, the anti-Semitism uh, definition of the IHRA, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And then also, finally, I will also be talking about um, Islamism, the link it has with anti-Semitism and uh, the threat, therefore, it poses to to Jewish uh, or to the Jewish community. So, to move on in terms of um, anti-Semitism, um, what I'd like to do is first give a background to some of the Arab anti-Semitism, and there's a reason why I'm um, talking about Arab anti-Semitism specifically. Uh, because when we think about Islamism, we're thinking about Islamism originating from the Middle East rather than the kind of um, the, um, the al Madhudi uh, um, Islamism that came from the Indian subcontinent. So I won't be referring to that anti Semitism, I'll be referring, oh, Islamism, I'll be referring to the um, Islamism from the Middle East and then how it's expanded, obviously, to um, India and uh, or the Indian subcontinent. And then obviously how it's uh, expanded to the West and then the threat it has to the Jewish community. So um, there was a scholar, uh, Yehoshaphat Harkabi, um, and he was the first scholar to write extensively about anti-Semitism in the Arab world. Um, it's obviously for, for many people, it's a, um, it's a contentious issue. Um, for many Arabs, they don't wanna consider themselves to be anti-Semitic per se. Uh, though they won't probably have an issue with actually um, being anti-Semitic in terms of the bistro anti-Semitism. Um, he considers, um, so Huckabee uh, considers um, anti-Semitism, or at least the Arab anti-Semitism, as a modern phenomenon, linking it essentially, in, essentially to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And, um, and he does talk about how that is the case. So, in terms of how it's deployed, we see familiar anti-Semitic tropes um, in the denunciation of Zionism, conflating Jews and Zionists as essentially being the same. Um, and then obviously um, insisting on the respect therefore for, um, for Judaism because um, for, for many Jews, um, they are Zionists, but not all Zionists 
Jews. So what he he talks about is there's the, there's a conflation between the two, and that neither can be separated, but they're also intertwined. And as a result, is uh, the Arab anti-Semites will look at anyone who is a Zionist as being a Jew, and therefore, um, whilst they will say um, anti-Zionist, what they really mean is actually I'm um, anti-Semitic. I don't like Jews. It's Judophobia. Our literature in the 60s increasingly drew from some of these Muslim traditions um, in the conflict between the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Jews and Quranic verses uh, that showed hostility to Judaism, to denounce Jews as evil, and the historic foes of Muslims. And in terms of historic foes for Muslims, uh, this is something or this is a message that appears to uh, be inherited amongst the many um, generations of Muslims um, throughout, um, throughout the years since the, since the Prophet Muhammad uh, 1400 years ago. So it's, it's something that hasn't been tackled or doesn't appear to be tackled in the way that is commensurate to um, preventing some of this anti-Semitism. Now, in terms of um, the Arab-Israeli conflict, one key turning point was the Six-Day War um, that took place. Uh, now, as in, in regards to this being a turning point, this is where um, the anti-Semitism, or at least the Arab anti-Semitism, really gained fuel and uh, gained uh, not necessarily legitimacy, but uh, gained a lot of popularity. And um, it was beginning to become mainstream, uh, a normal part of people's lives in, in, in the Middle East. Now, the, the Six Day War was also known as the June War or the Third Arab uh, Israeli War, or even the Naksa, uh, which was it was a brief war and it took place on June 5th, uh, or between June the 5th and the 7th in 1967. Now, it was the third of the um, wars between the Arabs and the Israelis. And Israel actually um, succeeded in this war, and it was a decisive victory. And it included the capture of the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, West Bank, Old City of Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. The status of these territories is obviously quite contentious, and subsequently became a major point in the Arab-Israeli conflict, because essentially for many onlookers, what they see is uh, two groups of people. Um, again, this is how it's viewed, or at least this is how it appears to be viewed. It's, it's, it's a, a conflict between Muslims and Jews um, over a, a bit of land is, is, is the easiest way to uh, perhaps um, um, to say it, or at least uh, for those um, who are not perhaps well versed in this. Now, the Six Day War led to a growing emphasis on Islamic aspects of the hostility against Israel and Jews, and it reflected in the increasing frequency of anti-Jewish articles published in the monthly journal of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo. Now, the Al-Azhar University in Cairo uh, is the leading uh, center of Islamic theology in the Muslim world. Um, this is where everyone goes to, to um, essentially, um, essentially train themselves up in Islamic theology. It is a Sunni in tradition, um, but that's not to say other denominations of uh, Muslims uh, do not attend uh, there or um, obviously um, uh, reap the benefits from being there. But anti-Jewish articles were being published there. And as a result, um, when the top university in the world, um, in terms of um, Islamic studies uh, or Islamic theology, is publishing articles that are anti-Jewish in nature, or appear to be anti-Jewish in nature, it does provide that, um, that legitimacy, that air of legitimacy that um, a lot of anti-Semites are, are looking for. And so for anti-Semites, they can quite easily then refer to um, the Al-Azhar University and say, well, look, these guys are publishing it, this, so it can't just be us. And uh, this is how they um, seem to try to recruit um, those who they believe are amenable to becoming anti-Semitic. So to advance uh, some of the um, 
actual examples of Arab anti-Semitism. In the Al-Azhar University, there was a grand sheikh, um, Hassan Mahmoud, and one of the things that he actually um, said was that Jews were destined to dispersion by the deity. And what he means by this is that um, Jews will never have a homeland and they will be scattered around the world. And that, in fact, the dispersion by the deity is that it was mandated by Allah, God. Um, and so what he's doing here by invoking God into this is that uh, he is essentially trying to gain further uh, legitimacy. And you, you will hear me use that word legitimacy quite often because essentially no one is born hating people. They're, they're taught it. And, um, and in order to teach something, you need to have a solid foundation uh, to which um, you can present your message or, or your learning material. And this is what um, these uh, anti-Semites do is they uh, look for ways to legitimize their view so that others uh, don't have a way of getting out of it. And I'll come on to that point of getting out of it um, a little bit later. Now, these remarks were following the 1967 war that I um, already uh, talked about. So this means that um, essentially the issue of um, Israel and Palestine becomes a Muslim issue rather than an ethnic or regional one. Indeed, furthermore, what the Sheikh also does here is he invokes the term deity to connote Allah, thereby making the issue as one of Islam and Muslims that requires uh, attention. So because Muslims are seen, or at least the majority of Muslims are seen as a, an ummah, which is a community, and that community is bound together by the religion of Islam. And if these issues are threatening Islam, therefore they are also threatening Muslims. And so Muslims need to obviously um, pay attention to this in whatever way that they can. And this is essentially what Islamist anti-Semites do, is they make it into a a Muslim issue and an Islam issue. Um, at all points, Islam and Muslims must be at attack in order for the offensive to take place. Now, there are perhaps some Muslims that find it difficult to accept Jews, uh, not how they are described in um, the religious scriptures. Uh, indeed, one of these issues is these hostilities and racism come to find themselves inherited by many Muslims because they exist in the scriptures. And this is one of the uh, key points that um, perhaps some of uh, our well-intentioned um, uh, members of the Muslim community, again, a diverse community, so it's not one community, but uh, made up of communities, um, is that we do have text in our uh, religious scripture, whether it's the Quran, which is the, the word of God, that, or the literal word of God that all Muslims believe, or the Hadith, which are the sayings of the prophet um, narrated down through many generations of people. Um, and they do contain, by today's standard, what we would consider anti-Semitism. And in terms of um, the actual Islamist anti-Semites, what they do is they draw from these scriptures. So they don't need to have the authority themselves because the authority comes from the scripture themselves. Um, in order to justify why it's okay to be anti-Semitic. And, um, and further, so uh, there's three examples um, that we can find in the Quranic text that would be considered anti-Semitic by today's standards. And this is uh, perhaps one of the ways that um, these anti-Semites recruit um, well-intentioned Muslims. The first one is... Um, from chapter 5, uh, verse 13, and it goes on to say, and because they broke their pledge, the Jews, we have cursed them. This is God saying this. And again and again, you will see that they produce falsehood. Okay, so what uh, this essentially means is that uh, there was a covenant between um, the children of Israel, um, essentially the Jews, um, uh, between them and God. Uh, this was broken. God therefore cursed them, and again you will see that they produce falsehood, and it's it's that last one falsehood, 
This is something that uh, uh, appears to be uh, inherited um, throughout the, you know, the generations that Jews will always uh, produce falsehood. They, they will always lie. Um, and this is obviously absurd, but that's the starting point that many of these um, Muslims appear to have. Um, and obviously I'm speaking here specifically about Muslims because the, the Islamists tend to tap, um, at least recruit Muslims first. Um, and I will talk about how they recruit those um, allies um, on, on, the other, on the other side who are not Muslims. Our second um, example, uh, in terms of from the from the Quran, uh, goes on to say, and you will surely find that people who prove to be the most hostile to the believers are the Jews and the pagans. Now, obviously, hostile to the believers. Believers, what they mean here um, is Muslims, are the Jews and the pagans. Now, the, there are two people that they're talking about here: Jews, which we we've been talking about, and then pagans. So I'll tackle pagans first. In regards to pagans, it's um, if you saw a pagan, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were pagan. Whereas with Jews, you definitely do because there are those who are visible Jews, uh, whether they wear the kippah um, or any other dress that's associated with uh, um, the Jewish identity. And so a lot of the Islamist anti-Semites don't necessarily focus so much so on the pagans because they don't necessarily know who they are, um, uh, whether it's um, visually or in terms of whether it comes to their aims uh, or their objectives or how they operate. So that's something that so that's a point that they, they don't focus on pagans here. They focus on the Jews. The pagans are, are just happen to be in that verse. It's not something that they, they're going to um, spend time laboring over. Um, our final example um, from the Quran uh, in terms of what we could consider as anti-Semitic by today's standards is this. And this is to punish them because they did not believe in Allah's signs and unjustly killed the prophets. Um, again, the them is uh, in reference to the Jews, the children of Israel, uh, because they did not believe in Allah's signs. And one of the key messages that you find in the Quran th uh, throughout <coughs> excuse me, is that as soon as um, uh, a message has been brought to you uh, and then you do not um, accept it, then it is on you. It is your responsibility. And then you have to obviously bear the burden of the punishment once the sign has been made. And so this is another way that uh, the Islamist anti-Semite Semites can um, obviously um, recruit and justify what they do, that um, the Jews have rejected the signs of Allah and they've also killed the prophets of old, and therefore they must be punished, whether it's in the dunya, which is this world, or in the akhira, the hereafter. And so the punishment can be made here or um, after death. Now, um, what I'd like to do is to tackle the aspect of Islamism and uh, to give some of our audience uh, some of the background to Islamism and kind of Islamist anti-Semites and how that obviously um, manifests itself in terms of um, uh, whether it's uh, the Baikala anti-Semitism, the Bistra anti-Semitism or the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance anti-Semitism. So the first thing I'd like to do is uh, talk about who the grandfather of um, Islamism is. Um, now, this is a, a gentleman known as Syed Qutb. Uh, he was the ideological founder of um, Islamism, and in particular, he was a theorist for violent jihad. So uh, when you um, think of um, groups such as um, Al-Qaeda, uh, Boko Haram, ISIS, um, the Taliban, they um, they very much heavily rely on um, Saeed Qutb in terms of his um, uh, theory of violent jihad. Now, he wrote uh, many works, um, and uh, his seminal piece of work was Milestones. And this is where many uh, jihadists, so violent jihadists who, who, who carry out acts of violence, uh, get, their, um, get their justifications from. Um, in terms of Qutb himself, he 
had actually traveled to America. And during, uh, I, I think he spent around two years there uh, in America. And um, during his time there, he was actually quite disturbed um, by what he saw in comparison to where he had come from, which was um, Egypt. It's quite bizarre, some of the things that he was disturbed by, um, things such as matching cushions. Um, so the cushions you'd find on your sofa, he, he was disturbed by those. He was disturbed by wallpaper. Um, he couldn't understand the, the patterns or, or the designs that, that some of them had. And bizarrely, he was also um, disturbed by bad haircuts. Now, whilst this uh, may seem uh, quite comical, um, it kind of gives you an insight into where his mind was at in regards to um, what he thought of the West. Now, matching cushions, uh, something nobody would probably ever um, consider, uh, so much so in terms of uh, other than decorating their home. It's not that bad, but for him it was. And uh, this, this gives you then uh, an insight into his mindset because it, presumably he didn't see that sort of stuff in Egypt, but as soon as he sees it in the West, it's a problem. So you start to find out that actually, magic cushions really aren't the problem. Bad hiccups are really aren't, aren't the problem. It's really the West and anything that is uh, going against kind of the Arab culture um, that he obviously inherited, Islam, and then um, uh, you know the, the aims and objectives of the Muslim Ummah. Now, the American's enjoyment of jazz was also something that um, he could not fully um, grapple. And uh, in fact, he um, does not fully begin to uh, uh, accept it. So he wrote that uh, when he returned to Egypt, it, um, in terms of jazz music, he said, it is this music that the savage Bushmen created to satisfy their primitive desires. So it wasn't just that he didn't like jazz. He was considering um, everyone in the West to Bushmen to be primitive, to um, to basically not be uh, a civilization commensurate to where he was currently at. So this is um, how he viewed not only the West but also the people in the West, the culture of the West, and and this really wound him up. Now, Qutb has a link with anti-Semitism, of course. Whilst it might be obvious, it's not necessarily always the case. Now, Qutb sought to Islamicize anti-Semitism and thus legitimize it for the uneducated Muslim. So he knew that um, if, if it came to debating with um, someone who is well versed in Islam, then obviously dealing with the um, aspect of um, anti-Semitism might be a bit tricky. So his target audience was the uneducated Muslim. And so what he wanted to do, though, was to Islamize it, so to make it into a concept that could then be drawn upon. So what he did was he drew on the Salafi jihadist ideology of um, the medieval scholar Ibn Tamiya, uh, such as loyalty and disavow, uh, which is known as uh, Allah wa al-Bara. And this signifies the loving and the hating for the sake of Allah. So essentially, he linked anti-Semitism to, <coughs> excuse me, to loving and hating of Allah. So if you weren't an anti-Semite, obviously they wouldn't admit to being an anti-Semite, <coughs> um, then you would essentially be hating Allah. So, <coughs> excuse me, could have, could have tied hatred of Jews to this, therefore holding Jews, uh, holding Muslims, hostage that if they refuse then they are no longer uh, muslims um so essentially they'll be akfir akfir means uh, they'll be excommunicated this is particularly powerful uh, technique to ensure that anti-semitism or the islamicized anti-semitism remains in the community and it flourishes because nobody wants to be accused of not being a muslim and so the only way you could say being a muslim was to obviously uh, be or show um, prejudice and hatred towards Jews. Now tying anti-Semitism to um, this essentially tied it to the concept of Tawheed, which is uh, the oneness of God. So the, uh, and, and this is essentially the bread and butter of being Muslim. So you cannot be a Muslim unless you believe that there is only one God, but Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger. And so he, he, he would tie anti-Semitism to this. 
um, into a uh, conceptual theory uh, for uh, Islamists to be able to attack Jews or to um, obviously recruit the uneducated Muslims. Masai Khatib was uh, the proponent of this theory. I also claimed in his pamphlet, so he had a pamphlet, and it was named uh, Our Struggle with the Jews. And in Arabic, it was <clears throat> it's pronounced as Marakatuna Ma Al Yahud, that the Jews have been involved in a cosmic war to um, des uh, destroy Islam since its founding. So, 1400 years, Islam has always been <clears throat> at risk from uh, Jews. Uh, this is essentially what he is arguing. Indeed, without jihad being central to the identity of Muslims, because it could not realize his Islamist ambitions. Thus, jihad wasn't just a struggle within yourself, um, but also a struggle against anything that threatens Islam and Jews. The conspiracy that Jews alongside the West are out to get Islam <coughs> provides the perfect backdrop for Islamists to recruit Muslims to their anti-Semitic cause. So, in terms of what is an Islamist, now an Islamist is an individual or a group that seeks to live their private or public life in accordance with Islam. The Islamists will seek to implement aspects of Islam into the culture of the country, the laws and the social attitudes of the public. This is known essentially as Islamism, which is a political version of Islam. So the, the whole point of uh, being an Islamist is to be able to live according to the laws of Islam not just personally, but publicly as well. Now, um, being an Islamist isn't, um, the, the, it's not a homogenous identity. There, there, are, uh, there is some diversity in it. Um, there are three types, therefore, um, of Islamists. There are the violent type. So that's looking at the jihadist uh, Salafist um, type. There are the non-violent type who, um, believe in, in the concept of jihad but choose not to uh, participate in that or to participate in democracy. And then there are the non um, the, or the participationist Islamists. And these are the guys who um, use um, the law of the land, um, particularly in the West. So they use the machinery of democracy, um, whether that's um, freedom of speech, freedom of belief to um, advance their cause. Now, um, the participationists are essentially the ones you will find um, within the bistro definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, so uh, Cohen's um, definition where he advances it and, and talks about the polite type. So participation, this Islamist and bistro anti-Semitism, uh, they, they believe in the long game. So when it comes to tackling the Jews, <clears throat> they're happy to work with them, but they're not happy to compromise. So what that essentially means is that um, if, they, if they want to work on something of uh, shared interest, um, they'll go ahead and do that, whether it's a charity event, whether it's um, standing up uh, against hate or anything like that. But if, um, if the Islamist feels threatened, that's when they take a step back and they will um, obviously uh, politely say no. Um, but as part of that, they have to then justify why they're saying no. And this is where the, um, their bistro anti-Semitism comes into, into, into force. Is, um, they essentially um, set out um, their reasons for not um, working with the Jews, but not being so explicit that it's not because you're Jews or it's not because of um, uh, any other reason um, that's legitimate to them, it's because of something that's on the surface. So something that they're not expected to, um, to say out in public. So, <clears throat> so how do Islamists um, or the participationist Islamists um, do this? Uh, one of the ways is that uh, they they infiltrate political parties, um, so they'll join them, uh, they'll gain positions of power to influence particular policies that are essentially Islam friendly and Muslim focused. Now, if you speak to any Islamists, um, essentially, if you ask them, would you want everyone to be Muslim? They, they, of course, they would say, yeah, 
uh, if they truly believe in Islam, then why not? If Islam is um, the, the true religion and being a Muslim is the only way to salvation, then why wouldn't you want everyone to be a Muslim? So of course they would say something like this. But um, in terms of actually saying that, well, they cannot because um, to do that, they could then alienate to their positions of power. So they have to be uh, a little bit careful in terms of um, what they're saying um, and uh, how they're behaving. Now, in terms of um, uh, the political parties and how they use them, um, Hamas, um, the terrorist group, it was recently prescribed here in the UK. Um, it's, it's been a long time coming, but um, fortunately it's, it's, it's arrived. Now, um, what we found is that some of the Islamists um, actually uh, took aim at this. Um, instead, they, um, they were protesting against British politicians for um, not doing the same. So the, the key point here is that whilst they weren't necessarily in disagreement that uh, Hamas were prescribed as a terrorist group, um, they were in disagreement that um, why hasn't Israel also been prescribed as a terrorist group? Um, quite obviously, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. So it seems bizarre that a democracy is being compared to a uh, to a terrorist group, whereas um, Hamas's charter is is quite clear. They, they they want to destroy Israel, whereas Israel is quite clear they don't want to destroy anywhere. So there is obviously that false um, dichotomy there between the two that they present um, as legitimate. And this is the thing. Um, so whilst Hamas are being um, prescribed and Israel is not, what the Islamists will do is they'll um, highlight that there's a hypocrisy here. Hamas, um, Israel are committing war crimes, uh, apartheid, um, and uh, ethnic cleansing of uh, Palestinians. So how can they not be um, prescribed a terrorist group? <coughs> so this is the messaging that the Islamists use. So is this obfuscation that conflates Israel as a legitimate company, uh, a country that is lawfully entitled to defend itself with Hamas, an internationally prescribed terrorist group? Now, this type of messaging has the potential to radicalize Muslims to take direct violent action. So that's the Bekela anti-Semitism against Jews in the West as a form of retaliation. In essence, the Islamists are at war with Jews. Um, to further point out, now, um, I mentioned earlier that um, the Islamists also seek to gain allies outside of um, the Ummah, the Muslim community. Um, so this is, um, and th what they found is they found bedfellows in, in, in the political left. And this is also known as the Red-Green Alliance. So the Red-Green Alliance essentially is Islamists will use the the far left, the hard left, however you want to, um, to, to talk about them or describe them, to carry out acts that either directly or indirectly, um, um, you know, prejudicing um, Jewish people. By joining forces, what they do is they um, seek to shut down some of those businesses that um, are perhaps um, uh, Israel, um, Israeli businesses or, or Jewish businesses. And uh, one of the tactics that we find um, quite often in the far left is that um, there are those who, who go out and protest and, and use, um, uh, and I mentioned this before, the machinery of democracy, um, use human shields or, uh, you know, uh, take over factories uh, and things like that. So some of that direct physical action of closing down businesses um, they, they will use um, and try to evade the law. Um, in terms of that. Um, and so the violent threat against Jews actually increases when things like that are happening. Because when these initiatives don't work, then the question then that needs to be asked is what happens next? If, if the non-violent action against uh, Jews is not working, or Jews and Israel is not working, then what's next? Because um, something has to happen. Well, according to, to these guys. So this is where uh, we come back to the Bekele, uh, um anti-Semitism, where um, 
physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are, are then brought forward. Now, Islamist participationists, they set up also legitimate companies, charities, and think tanks as a front to mainstream uh, that uh, bistro anti-Semitism. Um, and this, of course, uh, will need close monitoring. Um, these guys should not and um, be allowed to operate in this way that targets Jews. And this will need tackling. And it's, it's, it's going to be difficult because, um, you know, when someone is polite, uh, how do you um, necessarily <clears throat> highlight their anti-Semitism when it isn't always as blatant as uh, perhaps the Bekele anti-Semitism? So violent attacks against Jews as well happen as a result of hostile messaging that uh, is promoted by the Islamists and the, and the far left counterparts. That is not to say that the far right um, are not a risk. Of course, they're a risk. Uh, but when we're looking at Islamist anti-Semitism, it's looking at that uh, kind of nuanced bistro anti-Semitism and how they um, scapegoat Jews for all the ills in the world in a sophisticated way. So now Islamists, whether violent or non-violent, or even the participation, they can they can herald from anywhere. They can come from um, you know the Middle East. They can be born and brought up here, and this of course is a concern because um, you know they, they don't have to be manufactured from anywhere per se. They could just be uh, grown up in that um, in that messaging, uh, constantly being um, um, fed to them, and um, and obviously. This is this is quite concerning, and this then um, you can't obviously look at this without looking at um, kind of that in tandem with um, how um, the far right also use the same kind of messaging of those conspiracy theories, whether it's um, you know Jews controlling the world, the financial markets, media, and you even find that um, in in some of the um, uh, in, in in the black community in terms of um, in the music industry, uh, we saw um, last year a quite a well-known um, individual um, made anti-Semitic remarks in the UK um, and was subsequently taken off Twitter. Um, so it's it's things like that that you do see it. There are um, obviously shared interests between lots of these groups, whether they um, loosely work together or unintentionally work together. They all essentially have the same aim. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, Islamist extremism and Islamist anti Semitism or the violent uh, side, the Bekele anti Semitism, the Bistro, you can't really necessarily separate them. And, um, and so, one person doesn't necessarily um, show one type of anti Semitism. They do tend to um, meander between lots of different types. Um, so, the key point here is that we need to, when we are uh, considering this, uh, we do need to be able to distinguish between the the two and it might be a fine line between all of them um, but it's key that we are able to see it so in terms of um, what's next and how do we deal with this um, the alliance between communities the government and the corporations um, i think needs to be a united one i think we need to see more um, muslims working together with um, with the, the jewish community we need to see the government supporting um, a lot more social cohesion between uh, communities. Uh, last year, uh, during the months of May and June, uh, during the Gaza conflict, what we found was that uh, people were coming uh, from the north of um, from the north of England all the way to London to spew their anti-Semitism, and um, this this sort of uh, uh, export of anti-Semitism from different um, uh, spots of the country is quite concerning because um, there, there is clearly a network then, um, that exists. And so that needs to obviously be tackled. Um, movements such as uh, Black Lives Matter also um, need to be tackled because what we find is that some of uh, the grievances that uh, many in those movements have is against, um, it's against uh, um, white people. And for many uh, in, in those sorts of movements, they do essentially see um, Jews as being white and therefore powerful and therefore being part of the system that's uh, structurally against anyone who's an ethnic minority. Obviously, uh, notwithstanding the fact that many Jews are 
if not all, um, part of an ethnic minority. And communities themselves, they need to root out the Islamists, anti-Semites, in the same way that we did when it came to terrorism and extremism. Um, so we do, as a, as a Muslim community, um, a diverse Muslim community, need to tackle um, anti-Semitism and confront it wherever we see it. So, um, so that's essentially Islamism, anti-Semitism, it's, it's, um, and, and the kind of how the two link. So we've looked at obviously how uh, the 1967 war uh, was a pinnacle point um, for it to start mainstreaming itself. Um, that, um, you know, obviously the caveat is that it's not to say that it didn't exist before then, of course it did, but this gave it, gave it the impetus to uh, catapult itself into what we see today. And it keeps getting itself stronger because Islamist anti-Semites, they learn and they are pragmatic. And uh, pragmatism is one of the guiding principles of Islamism, is that, the, uh, is that uh, sometimes you have to um, compromise uh, in order to uh, achieve your aims. So I'm going to leave it there for any questions. And, um, and I thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you very much, Wasik, for your excellent talk and, and for the work that you do. Um, we have a question from Gunther here. I'm going to allow you to speak. So you, if you unmute yourself, you'll be able to, to ask your question. Hi, thank you very much for this excellent talk. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yep, can we you hear can hear me? you. Oh, great. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I, my question was just, if you have published some of it, I would like to read it and um, reference it as well. Uh, so if you have published it, could you share that, please? In a, maybe in a link or so, if you have. I saw that you have published some articles in uh, Times of Israel, I think. Um, but maybe you have something something uh, additional that I haven't seen, but that's excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, of course. Um, so I've got quite a few um, articles published on this uh, topic. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, actually, um, uh, two weeks ago, um, this might be of interest to you, um, I was a part of um, um, a lobbying event uh, with the Christian Friends of Israel and the Zionist Federation, Federation to have the PFLP um, so the um, uh, to be prescribed as a as a terrorist group, uh, bizarrely, they're still not prescribed. So that um, so the speech for that is um, should be released soon, which also mm -hmm. those issues. But yeah, of course, um, I'll I'll send everything to El Shaday, and uh, she should be able to um, uh, send it out to the network. Yes, sounds good. No problem. We will be able to do that. Um, I have another question here. Um, do you see a trend of decreasing Islamism in the East and increasing Islamism in the West? Uh, no, not really. Um, what I am seeing is that there are different forms of Islamism in the East and the West, and uh, they operate differently because the environment is different. Uh, in the West, it's essentially a kufr environment. So the word kufr means uh, non-Muslim. Um, whereas in the East, there are pockets of um, Muslim majority countries. And so the, it's a bit easier, uh, not necessarily um, easy, but easier to, um, to kind of implement some of those things, whereas over here, it's, it's uh, not necessarily the case. Um, there is one point that I'd like to make in terms of um, the Islamism here in the West. Um, the Islamists, they're, they're very smart. They know that they cannot change the law of the land. But what they can do is they can um, help shape the culture of the land. Uh, I'll give you a, a classic example of this. Um, recently, um, a school in um, in the north or in the north of England um, had a teacher who had um, shown a, um, a a depiction of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and um, as a result of that. The, um, a lot of um, Islamists um, began protesting against the school and they wanted the teacher to be fired uh, because it was blasphemous and, and everything like that. And whilst the, the school are not obliged to obviously fire a, a teacher for showing a, a depiction of the prophet, um, they, they essentially still had to do something about it. And so um, they couldn't fire him because um, it's not a, a breach of any law. 
Um, you can say what you want about um, any religion or ideology um, in, in the West, essentially, because we do have the principle of freedom of speech. Um, and so they know, the Islamists know they, they can't change the law, but what they can do is change the culture. And as a result, they kept pressurizing the school. Um, the, the teacher was also threatened. Uh, in fact, even now, it's been over a year and he's still in hiding as a result of this. And so th it's, it's this sort of, so um, in terms of the um, Bayekela um, anti-Semitism where they use violence uh, and, uh, towards Jews, they also you, um, use violence towards anyone who's uh, threatening um, uh, Muslims or Islam. So um, although, um, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Jew who's um, uh, against uh, or seen as a threat uh, against Muslims and Islam, um, the Islamists will do whatever they can in terms of um, that, um, of obviously being, um, being able to, um, you know, um, protect Islam. Essentially, Islam has to be um, at, um, at war for the Islamists to exist. Without that narrative, it's difficult. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Do you think anti-Semitism is an issue in general within Islamic communities in the UK, or is it only an issue in more extreme Islamist sects? Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, is it a, uh, an issue generally, um, I do think there is some general issues in terms of anti-Semitism, and, and this is what I was alluding to um, earlier on, that when we do look at um, Islamism, uh, anti-Semitism within the Muslim community, we need to um, tackle some of those texts that we find in the Quran, and uh, obviously by today's standards, they do appear to be uh, anti-Semitic, but um, these are historical records, and, and, and they are... Um, you know, wrapped in, in theological, um, you know, um, debate. Um, but because those texts and that kind of messages, or that kind of messaging has been inherited over time, that doesn't tend to then be um, challenged in, in a modern day context. And this is, I suppose, um, a more broader issue for Islam and Muslims that um, uh, they, um, they need to tackle is um, there, there's a heavy reliance in Islam on, on scholars uh, or the ulema, um, uh, the legal theorists, um, and we need to be able to move away from that. Um, we, we go to them when we need to, but uh, we need to be able to think more independently and kind of look more in, in terms of the humanity um, aspect of um, uh, whether it's Jews, Christians, non-believers, pagans, you know, Whoever it is, we, we need to look at people as humans first before we look at them in terms of the religious identity um, and, uh, and also draw from some of those, um, the, the stories of, um, you know, how uh, Muslims, um, or at least the Prophet Muhammad would um, protect Jews and or work in conjunction with Jews um, because it's okay to. And to be able to say that needs to be more normalized. Uh, so. Um, Islamists will always have a, an issue with Jews. Um, Muslims don't tend to, uh, but they do need to root it out when they do see it, or at least be able to um, have the have the emotional intelligence to see it within themselves when they are regurgitating some of that. And education does obviously uh, come into this, and and, the, and there needs to be an aspect of that. Okay, thank you. And as a follow up to that question, um, we have another one say to be more specific, in Egypt, have there been more improvements in reducing anti Semitism since the Arab Spring, predominantly under Al Sisi? Is this changing the culture or only the political perception? Um, I think, um, in terms of um, just generally in, in the Middle East, um, I think it was the ADL who done a, um, a survey of um, anti-Semitism or uh, attitudes of um, anti-Semites, um, or at least the, the Muslim majority. Um, and what they found was that over three quarters of the population within the Middle East um, were harbored anti-Semitic attitudes. Um, I think it was the ADL, um, I do confirm that. Um, and this is a massive problem. Um, and I think um, whether it's changing, it's, it's really difficult to see. Um, we need to see it, obviously, 
in terms of right at the top um, with, with the leaders, um, and then for that to um, trickle down to, to the communities. But it's really difficult to measure um, and, and to know for certain. But in terms of globalization, people are moving around um, you know, to different areas. Um, you know, we, we, we've, we've got the threat of Islamist jihadists um, all over the Middle East, um, whether it's Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, you know, ISIS, um, those, those sorts of guys. And obviously the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in Egypt. And, uh, and so one of the ways to perhaps tackle that is to see if we can uh, regulate some of those legitimate forces and to uh, empower them. Um, through um, through some some of those uh, some of that dialogue, whether it's the Abraham uh, Accords or, or any other kind of initiative, uh, but um, whether it's changing in culture, it's it's difficult to say. You'd have to be there. You'd have to talk to some of the people on the ground and kind of see what they are. And and I would add that most people are not necessarily um, anti-Semitic. You know, they don't even have to be Muslim, um, but they don't have. Uh, they're not necessarily anti-Semitic, but they do inherit uh, some of that anti-Semitism. And it's that, it's that uh, inheriting um, that that needs to be tackled where it's it's normalized. Um, you know, I, I remember growing up here, we, we used to, um, I used to hear lots of um, jokes um, made at the expense of Jews. And I, I've never actually encountered a Jew, but, um, but there was always a perception that Jews are only interested in money and they're very tight. They don't want to spend any of the money or, or, or you know, they, they, they control the media and, and, and that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, with that famous artist that I um, talked about earlier, um, he was regurgitating stuff that, um, and he, he, he's around my age, he's regurgitating stuff that I, I used to hear as a child. And so uh, those sorts of things are no longer fashionable and they perhaps were um, once once upon a time, but they're no longer fashionable now. And he's obviously bearing the brunt of that and and um, learning a hard lesson and, and good, he, sh he should be. But the fact is that it still stayed with him even after, you know, our essentially political correctness and, and, and stuff like that has um, kind of uh, come, come through. So, um, it's, it's, it, again, it goes back to that emotional intelligence. People need to realize that it's not okay. You, know, you, you shouldn't prejudice uh, anyone at the expense of their identity, um, their religious identity. Okay, uh, we are running out of time, but maybe we can just squeeze in this one last question. Um, would you then say some sections of the Quran are outdated? Um, if so, how can we tackle this in normative Islam where many might not necessarily act on the anti-Semitic passages, but inherit the sentiments nonetheless? Yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, passages of the Quran are outdated. Um, essentially, um, I'd say 99% of Muslims believe that the, the Quran, uh, well, 100% will certainly believe that the Quran is the word of God and 99% would uh, believe that uh, it's for you know the the end of time uh, and so it's about being able to reread the text and uh, to be able to um to apply it to a modern day context um so there, there's a there's a concept in islam um which which talks about being able to reread the text because we don't essentially um live in, in 40, you know, sixth uh, century Arabia, we, we live in the West here in the, in the 21st century. So we need to be able to reread the text. So we need to um, be able to train some of our imams, our, our Islamic scholars, um, so, um, to, to be able to um, look at um, it in a, a modern context and uh, essentially go back to kind of the principles of the Quran, which is uh, humanity. Uh, one of the principles uh, uh, in the Quran is that um, to, it, to kill one person is like killing the whole of uh, mankind, but to save one person is like saving the whole of mankind. Uh, so wouldn't it be great to be able to do, um, to say that for, for Jews? Um, so if Islamists can, um, th this, this is what I mean about regulating the Islamists, like, such as the Muslim Brotherhood or the Bistro, um, uh, those polite ones is to is to get them to start thinking like that to get them to start pushing that that sort of messaging um essentially because once once you start doing that some of that 
some of the, the messages that we uh, inherit um, are then challenged um, in, a, in a more subtle way. Um, sometimes that's needed uh, or sometimes it needs to be done in a direct way. Thank you very much, Wasik. Um, that's all we have time for, for today. Um, for all of those asking, this recording will be made available to everyone who has registered. Um, so thank you again. Thank you.